Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us this morning. I'm Greg Newman. I'm Director of Communications for World Council of Credit Unions. And thanks for joining us for our webinar, COVID-19 Response Committee webinar on COVID-19 related money laundering and terror financing, terrorism financing risk. We've got a great agenda today, um, including a presentation on the challenges, good practices, and policy responses to new money laundering and terrorist financing threats and vulnerabilities arising from the COVID-19 crisis by Shauna Krishnan. She's a policy analyst for the Financial Action Task Force, or FATF, which is the independent intergovernmental body recognized for setting global standards for anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing responsibilities. After that, we're gonna hear how credit unions and other cooperative financial institutions must advocate for proportional treatment on AML CFT regulation, that's going to be with World Council's own Senior Vice President of Advocacy, Andrew Price, and also John Byrne. He is the Executive Vice President and Chair of AML Right Sources Advisory Board. AML Right Source is a U.S.-based firm focused solely on helping financial institutions find anti-money laundering, or as you may know it in the U.S., Bank Secrecy Act and Financial Crimes Compliance Solutions. But before we get to that, I'm going to turn it over now to the chair of our COVID-19 response committee, Mr. Yunsi Kim. He is the CEO of the National Credit Union Federation of Korea. Mr. Kim. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining uh, this uh, webinar, and uh, I am very uh, nice to see uh, you all of you virtually. I am the, the head and the chairman of Kim Yun Sik, who is leading the COVID-19 response committee. And because of Corona-19, the pandemic, uh, the credit unions are being challenged, and even the uh, health and the daily lives of where people are threatened. And at the time of a crisis, credit unions can gather uh, together and we need to join forces together to find a solution to come out of this crisis. I think that that's why you are joining today's webinar. I hope that today's webinar could inspire you about the how to respond to the pandemic crisis. Thank you so much for joining us today. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kim, and thank you for your leadership on our COVID-19 response committee. Um, I do want to mention just some housekeeping. If you have uh, the need for Spanish translation, we do have Spanish translation available. There should be a, uh, an interpretation a button on the bottom of your screen. You can click on to go to the Spanish translation feed here. Also, if you have questions throughout the webinar, please just use the uh, button that's at the bottom of the screen that says Q&A, and you can put the questions, you can type your questions right in there. We're gonna be taking some from the attendees uh, later on in our webinar. But for now, I'm going to turn it over now to Shauna Christian from the Financial Action Task Force. Shauna. Thanks, Greg, um, and thanks to the whole WUKU team for this invitation. It's really a, a big pleasure uh, for us to be here and, and to talk with all of you. Um, I work in the policy development team in the FATF. Um, you know, as, as Greg mentioned, we are the standard setter for anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing. There are about 200 countries or more who have committed to, to upholding these standards. Um, and actually, even though COVID-19 has meant that many of us aren't able to travel, it has given us this very unique opportunity um, to be able to do quite, quite a lot more outreach um, than we could have done if we, we'd had to do that travel. So happy to be with you. Um, and I, I would love to tell you a little bit about what the FATF has been doing, what we've been seeing, um, but it's also a good opportunity to, for me to hear about um, how it's been for the credit unions. And I'd, I'd really love to hear a little bit about your experiences too, and, and uh, I welcome for you to share that. So I'll start with the FATF's role. Um, the FATF has done quite a lot of work um, since March in, in looking at how countries have responded to COVID-19. Um, the picture on the, on the slide is the report that we did in May. Um, and there was a statement as well by the FATF president at the time, which clearly highlighted you know, how important it was for countries to take a risk-based approach in relation to COVID-19. Um, we've also brought governments together to kind of understand um, get them to learn from each other what they've done in response to, to the COVID-19, but also to understand the risks and to um, increase outreach with the private sector to kind of let them know as well what they need to be looking out for. 
I'm going to talk to you a little bit more in detail of what we've learned. Uh, this slide has the outline um, of the report um, and it basically talks about three different um, issues. Firstly, the kind of threats and vulnerabilities we've seen as a result of COVID-19, the impact it has on money laundering and how criminals are, are doing their business. Um, also the impact on the private sector and on government. Um, we've all had to change the way we work and that's also had an impact on how anti-money laundering measures are actually being put into place. And lastly, some of the policy um, recommendations we've made to countries and to the private sector uh, on how to best deal with the situation. I'm going to start with a slide on changing financial behaviours. Um, this is not a slide that we usually use, but it's actually really, really important to understand the risks. Um, we need to think about how people's behaviour is changing in the current situation um, and to, to, to understand how that kind of impacts the, the risks that the businesses are facing. So the first thing that the report talks about is, you know, increased remote transactions and that makes sense, right? Because confinement, social distancing, um, some branches might be closed down due to lockdown measures. Um, some banks are introducing reduced opening hours or restricting services uh, in person. And so more people are turning to online banking uh, or remote transactions. But we've seen as well that not all financial institutions um, are ready to cope with that, uh, including some smaller institutions. The second key thing is the un unfamiliarity with online platforms. So while people, um, businesses might have been happy to kind of move over to using new technology, some customers um, are not used to or not comfortable necessarily to shifting to banking online. The report talks about elderly or low income groups, um, remote or indigenous communities who might just not have access uh, to the technology as well. Um, I always think about my auntie um, in India who uh, lost, unfortunately lost her husband a couple of years ago and he used to do all of the, the, the banking for the family, it took care of all the financial matters. And I remember spending half a day um, sitting down with her just teaching her how to use some of the online um, apps in, in terms of dealing with her banking. Um, people like that, especially in this time period, really are really struggling. Um, and there, there are issues because um, issues such as bank fraud um, are targeting people's um, financial or account information um, because they might not necessarily know who to trust or who to turn to at this moment. And the last point on this slide is unrela unregulated financial services. So one of the points we've tried to make is that if businesses and um, the financial institutions apply overly strict requirements at this time, what we'll actually do is to turn people over to unregulated sectors. Uh, and what we mean here is kind of non-traditional unlicensed lenders, uh, lenders, including potentially criminal groups who have cash at their disposal um, and are looking for places um, to kind of park that at the moment. So this brings me to, to the next main kind of issue, the identified threats and vulnerabilities. And there are two big issues um, that we kind of see over and over again, and that's fraud and cybercrime. We've seen a very, very large increase in fraud. And the sorts of examples we've given in the report look at the impersonation of officials. Um, so this could be a situation, for example, where uh, there are officials who are offering uh, people um, tax relief and ask um, for customers' personal banking details. Um, and, you know, unwitting unwitting customers can provide those details thinking that this is actually coming from from official channels. Another thing that we've seen is online scams including medical supplies, um, personal protective equipment and medicines. So in these situations the scams either they don't deliver the goods once they've collected payment or they might be selling counterfeit products as well. And then finally on fraud, we also mentioned fundraising or fake charities, um, basically criminals posing as charities um, and, and raising money that way. In terms of cybercrime, um, I'm just staying on the same slide. So in terms of cybercrime, we've seen an increase in online activity um, with more people moving to um, remote working arrangements. So there's more kind of con transactions being conducted online and this leads to increased uh, vulnerability uh, for people to be kind of the victims of cybercrime. And the sorts of things that we've picked up on are increases in identity theft, business email compromise, malware and ransomware attacks and, and phishing schemes as well. 
if you are using kind of digital um, authentication measures, I guess though, these are the important things to keep in mind. The, these increased cybercrime risks mean that the mitigation measures you have in allowing people to access um, your, your platforms have to be stronger. Then there's another um, other, uh, I'm just gonna go back to the slide, sorry, on, uh, on threats and vulnerabilities. I'm still there, thank you. Uh, so some of the other crimes um, we're talking about uh, corruption, um, if you are dealing with um, customers that are politically exposed persons or family members, associates, think kind of things that we were trying to raise awareness of uh, people potentially obtaining kickbacks um, for government contracts, because there's less um, scrutiny of these things under emergency measures. Then there's also a lot of fraud related to exploitation of stimulus measures, um, you know, criminals creating new accounts um, for people with, with their st stealing their identity or creating uh, accounts in the names of um, fictitious companies just for the purpose of, of obtaining illegitimate benefits. One of the really sad things that we've seen as well um, uh, are increases in crimes that, you know, might not ne necessarily look to be in relation to financial fraud. Um, I've mentioned online child exploitation. Um, it's very sad, but you know, there is an increase of demand uh, of this material because more people are spending time online. And unfortunately also an increase in supply as children um, don't have the opportunity to escape some of the situations that, that, that put them in danger. So there's a whole range of crimes um, that are being committed. Um, some members have reported that there is an increased risk of health related businesses being used to cover and move uh, money at this time. And some of the, the issues or kind of the indicators of this are kind of companies changing their business activity very drastically um, to explain financial activity. I heard a case quite recently from a country um, which was actually in relation to an individual, a stay at home mum who was doing some um, freelance accounting work had suddenly started dealing with multi-billion dollar contracts for, um, for masks. So um, these kind of um, changes in business activity um, can also um, be just a cover for, for moving criminal funds. There are also risks around criminals taking over or exploiting bank accounts related to businesses um, or individuals. As we know, there are a lot of people who might have lost um, their source of income um, they're more vulnerable to being recruited right now as mules or digital mules for criminal organizations, um, allowing them for maybe um, a percentage um, of profit to for the criminals to allow their move their funds through their accounts. And that's something that we've tried to raise awareness of as well. So moving on now to, to some of the AML-CFT measures and, and the impact on institutions. Uh, I think it's fair to say that, that there has been an impact kind of across the board. Um, and there are many kind of compliance teams and officers, probably many of you um, that are working from home or not able to work at all or working in very different conditions. So in terms of the private sector, what we've seen is those entities that have in general better business um, continuity planning have fared better. Um, those that have done um, risk assessment and risk management processes that have um, access to digital technology tools tend to have found it easier to adapt and respond in the current environment. As I mentioned before, there have been um, situations of um, closing branches, limiting services or redeploying staff, but we haven't seen um, you know, a big um, decrease in the attention that anti-money laundering um, has, been, has been seeing at this time. But it's important to note that you know, not everybody, uh, not all the entities have the technology um, to adapt and to work from home. Um, communication between staff members has been more complicated and access to sensitive information as well has been more complicated um, remotely. And then the, the main kind of issue we've seen in terms of applying AML CFT measures as well is in relation to customer due diligence about being able to collect that information when you're not having face-to-face -face interaction with the customers um, and including both domestic and foreign customers as well. I'll come back to that. On suspicious transaction reporting, uh, we've seen the whole range um, of responses actually. So in some members, we're seeing lower numbers of reporting um, and they explain that um, because of a slowdown in economic activity. So there's also a, um, a decrease in suspicious activity. Um, it might also be due to a decreased capacity within the entities to actually file the CRs um, at this time. 
some some countries are also reporting no change at all um, from last year, similar amounts of SCR reporting. And then other countries are reporting higher numbers of SDRs, um, all related to COVID-19 related activity like scams or the government stimulus measures I mentioned. Um, there's also been kind of a surge in reporting in some countries um, where businesses are operating despite lockdowns, where that's kind of considered illegal or criminal activity. Then there's obviously been an impact um, on the government, on FIU's financial intelligence units, the law enforcement, international cooperation. I'll focus a little bit on FIU's because that might be um, the area where you guys are kind of most impacted. Um, globally, we've seen that FIU's have generally remained operational during the crisis, but that's, um, you know, there's more of a concern in relation to lower capacity countries um, that don't necessarily have the materials or the, or the technology to work offline. Um, accessing secure or confidential information is just um, a, big, a big of an issue in the, in the government as it is for the private sector. Um, and those FIUs that haven't digitalized their reporting requirements are um, obviously struggling as well. Lastly, in terms of supervisors, um, uh, one of the kind of main things that we've said is that they should increase their guidance and outreach at this time um, and, and to provide some leeway in situations um, where there are non-essential requirements um, to kind of ease the burden on some of the entities at the moment. A lot of anti-money laundering um, on-site inspections have been postponed or done virtually or a mix of both desk-based and kind of um, in-person inspections. But the focus um, should be, and I think has been mostly on high-risk entities at this time. We've also seen um, some supervisors use monitoring tools and technology um, to kind of perform some of their functions, but in an offline kind of manner. So the policy responses, there are sort of nine areas in the report, but I don't have time to go through all of them with you. I'll mention four of them. Um, effective domestic cooperation. This is really um, a recommendation mostly for, for government, um, but basically having different agencies, having the right information from all those agencies, understanding the risk and giving consistent messages to the private sector is, has really been integral. Um, and while that's a, a recommendation for government, it's, I think, important also for the private sector to keep in mind um, coordination between different areas, between the, um, the frontline um, business areas and the compliance areas is also really important um, to ensure that taking, you know, a fully integrated risk-based approach. We've also said, as I mentioned before, that proactively engaging with the private sector is really, really important. And um, we've asked supervisors and FIUs to do this. Um, the report um, it makes reference to about 50 examples of countries um, which have kind of issued statements to the private sector to tell them what's expected of them, um, what they can focus less on and what they really need to, to keep looking at during this time. Um, then I think the most important point um, of my probably presentation today is the importance of taking a flexible risk-based approach to risk mitigation. Um, this, this moment, this period, the crisis has really been a stress test for the risk-based approach. Um, and we've kind of highlighted over and over again that taking a heavy-handed approach or taking a very rules-based approach will actually backfire uh, on us internationally. Um, because people moving to the unregulated sector where none of these rules apply is really the worst that we could um, that we could hope for at the moment. So we need to kind of understand the changing behaviors that I set out to look at some of the new risks and then adapt accordingly. And there are tools in the FATF standards that allow you to do this. Um, the recommendation one is really about taking a risk-based approach but also the customer due diligence requirements also allow um, for the taking of a risk-based approach as well. We had a meeting yesterday with the Gates Foundation, with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and they told us that over 60 million new accounts were opened uh, during the pandemic due to the use of simplified due diligence. And the FATF does allow that, and we require countries um, to, to include that as part of their risk-based approach where, where you can see lower risks or you can put in adequate mitigation measures, uh, simplified due diligence should allow you um, to continue uh, operating and providing essential financial services. So even in normal times, a risk-based approach can you know, lead to a more effective system, but right now in the time of the crisis, I think it's absolutely critical. Um, and we really kind of encourage all entities 
um, to use this opportunity to continue to improve your risk assessment process, to ensure that you have the right information, to ensure that the risk assessment processes are dynamic enough to take into account changing circumstances and behaviours. Um, and to go to your boards, um, your bosses to say, you know, that you need the resources to, to look at this um, so that you can respond um, as best as you can. And, you know, also for the next time around to make sure that you're better prepared. And then the last point on this policy responses is about harnessing responsible innovation. Um, and the FATF kind of often says that we're technology neutral. We don't tell you what type of technology you should use, but we're not silent about how um, technology can bring real benefits and how, um, how you can apply AML CFD mitigation measures. And the key thing here is the digital ID guidance um, that we issued in March this year. Uh, which basically says that non-face-to-face -face onboarding is not necessarily high risk. Um, it can be low risk or standard risk as long as we're using trustworthy digital ID. Um, and the, the guidance provides much more um, information about how you might be able to determine that. Um, and I know that's something that a lot of people have been asking us about specifically when you know trying to um, adapt new technologies uh, at the moment in response to COVID-19. So hopefully the current situation should be a prompt to think about how technology can improve the way we work. And that brings me, I guess, to our last slide, which just kind of sets out the main conclusions. Um, as I mentioned, countries are facing new predicate crime risks, including fraud, the misuse of government benefits at this time and increased cybercrime. So we ask all entities to, to be more aware of this um, in, in their work. Overall, global systems have been fairly resilient and we're kind of happy um, to see that and to see how quickly people have responded and, and changed their focus. And the risk-based approach, I think, again, um, is really key to ensuring that we can deal with the current situation. Um, and then kind of noting flexibility, increased coordination and the engagement that needs to happen between uh, the regulated entities, yourselves and your supervisors to really have a clear idea of, of where to go forward um, and to apply the kind of technological solutions that are available, hopefully to, to most of us now um, in, in kind of responding to these risks. Thanks, Greg. Thank you, Shauna. That was uh, pretty eye-opening, I think, uh, for everybody who's out there and uh, listening. And I think even for Andy and John, who are um, also experts when it comes to AML CFT, but I think they probably learned some things too. Um, and I want to turn it over now to Andy Price. He is our uh, Senior Vice President for Advocacy here with Royal Council of Credit Unions, and he's going to speak with John Byrne from AML RightSource uh, and Shauna about what Shauna presented and also how credit unions can do a better job. Shauna mentioned supervisors, I believe Shauna, another word for that is regulator, um, but how credit unions and other cooperative financial institutions can advocate for proportional treatment on these AML CFT regulations. So Andy, I'll turn it over to you. And thank you, Greg, and, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I really wanna thank uh, 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 Shanna for being here. It's a real honor to have uh, uh, FATF on this call, and it's a real service uh, to our credit unions who are, you know, working their way through their pandemic. And uh, I, I really want to compliment um, FATF for for their approach on the COVID nineteen crisis. They were out really early uh, in the crisis. I mean, the, this report came out in in, in March, um, which I, I think was um, um, uh, fabulous. We were able to get kind of you know what they were seeing from their perspective. Uh, early on, and, and particularly dealing with a lot of the the, the scams and out there, um, uh, so so I, I applaud FATF for doing that, and 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 I hope they continue this as as we have other crises that come up in the uh, 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 in the future as well. I mean, it's really important important for our credit unions. I mean, when, when there's more communication, uh, you know, horizontally among the regulators, and then vertically, you know, down to uh, financial institutions and credit unions. Uh, uh, I, I, th I think the whole system works better and, and more efficiently. I mean, number one, uh, to help the credit union stay up with the current threats that are out there, uh, because those are always changing. The, the, the bad actors out there are sophisticated, they're smart, they're always changing their methods. Uh, so, so staying on top of it from that perspective uh, uh, is important. But, but two, uh, to go back to the efficiency, um, uh, point, uh, you know, it, it, when when we do this, it allows credit unions to kind of stay focused on 
of you know what's important, what's important to to law enforcement, to the regulators, uh, uh, and in their credit unions. Um, because I often think credit unions feel like a lot of times they're just doing paperwork and it's uh, uh, glow, going into a black hole. Um, and, and, and so, I, I, you know, this type of communication when we have a situation like this, I think, I think is, is wonderful and, and helps everybody do a job, um, you know, that's more efficient and more meaningful. Um, so I applaud FATF on their approach um, uh, on this uh, as well. Um, I, I, want, I want to back up for a second because we have some, you know, 20 to 30 different countries um, um, uh, on the line. And, 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 and FATF may be a little bit new to them. So I kind of want to just uh, speak for a second uh, uh, about the, the, the regulatory framework and, and, and FATF's roles and kind of how FATF fits into this. They, they are an international standard setting body. Uh, you know, and, and what that means is, is, is a lot of the countries, I think Shannon alluded to it, there's, there's over 200 countries that have agreed to you know, uh, implement the FATF standards, but let me let me talk about what that means. Um, um, uh, you know, from a, from kind of a practical standpoint, so you can kind of understand uh, how this filters down to you. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, all the countries around the world, the the regulators, the supervisors participate uh, uh, in this process and, and kind of you know come to an agreement as to what the standard. Um, uh, around the world is going to be in fat, fat issues these standards and then your your respective countries uh, kind of take those and and adopt them in, in your country within your regulatory framework that you have to comply with so a lot of times you're looking to your regulator for what you need to do but I just want you to understand I mean a, lo a lot of these principles and concepts comes from FATF and they're out there and you can look at them and and, and read them and that will help you as as your um, uh, uh, in your in your in your uh, credit union when you're um, uh, doing this, but FATF understands that there are a diverse set of institutions that fall under this. There, you know, you got your big boy banks, your Deutsche Bank, HSBC, J.P. Morgan, who have uh, all all those. You know, what they need to do is much different um, uh, from from you as 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 a as a credit union. And so, what I want to point out, and 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 Shanna alluded to this, there is a lot of flexibility that's built within this framework. Uh, and, and there's a, a lot of language when you go in there that says the, these regulations need to be tailored to the size, risk, and complexity of your institution. We call it here, we call that proportionality. You may hear me use that term. That's what that means. Uh, and that has done a wonderful job uh, of expressing this down to national level regulators uh, that when they are adopting these regulations, uh, you know, that they take a risk-based approach, that they allow these regulations to be tailored to the size, risk, uh, and complexity of your institution, uh, and, and and that's that's ex that's very important. So that uh, you know you're not just uh, overwhelmed with with uh, paperwork and regulatory, and that's not that what they want. They want you to, of course, do your job uh, uh, and, and looking for bad actors coming through your institutions, uh, but not to be so overwhelmed. And particularly, you'll see language on on financial inclusion that no regulation um, uh, should be so burdensome that it denies access to. A, a marginalized group or underserved area as well. So they want it to work for your um, uh, financial institution. And so there's financial inclusion guidance that they have out there that I would urge you to go look at, uh, particularly when you're talking to your regulators um, uh, about your obligations and the framework that they are giving to you um, uh, 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 for, for your AML, CFT or, or Bank Secrecy Act uh, 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 compliance as well. What we see, though, is national regulators are often hesitant, though, to properly tailor them down for credit unions, and, and the reason is, is kind of simple. No regulator wants a bad actor to be, you know, having their money come through an institution that they supervise or regulate, and they don't want their country to get that reputational risk. Uh, so I, I wanted to point out that framework to you and the flexibility that's in, in, involved in there so that you understand when you're, when you're working with your regulator at national level, um, uh, that hopefully they can work with you to make make the requirements all what all of us have to do uh, under the framework work. And so I'm going to get off my soapbox here a little bit because John's on here and he's got a ton of wisdom for us. So uh, I'll, I'll kick it over to you. <laughs> uh, thanks, Andy and um, uh, Shauna. That presentation was so succinct and so valuable. Wish we could package it and bring it to our regulators and others. Um, around the globe. So I just, I'd make a couple of points. It seems that what we're focused on is access and security. 
right? I think that's sort of the themes of all of this. And to Andy's point, one size doesn't fit all. I've been doing this for a really long time. I've been with banks, I've been with trade associations, uh, and, I, and I work with the community, community banks, mid-sized institutions, large and fintechs, and some, some credit unions. And we can't emphasize enough that no one wants to have uh, illicit funds through their institutions. I think the challenge has been when you designate something as higher risk, and we'll, I'll talk in a second about how the pandemic has shaped that a little bit. But when you talk about something as higher risk, the institutions have to make a decision on how they're gonna manage that. I believe, and I think you alluded to this, institutions clearly can manage higher risk activity. They, they have mitigation procedures in place. They certainly have uh, you know, staffing resources. It obviously depends on the risk in the institution. Uh, but I think any institution that wants to manage a risk that their risk appetite allows for can do that, right? And so the issue is, can you uh, appease your regulators, your supervisors, that what you've done is sufficient? To Andy's point, the um, challenge is, is that they are, the regulators, a little fearful. They want to make sure that if the institution is mitigating a risk, that the, it doesn't come back and on, on the regulators for somehow allowing something to occur, right? And so what we have, the result of all that, and Andy and I have talked about this before, is the concept of de-risking, right? And I think that's the fear that we have during the pandemic specifically because now we're all remote. You talked about the, the transactional distinctions that occur during the pandemic. And so you have to make a decision, um, can you mitigate risks that are different than they were a year ago, right? And so what an institution then, then decides for a variety of reasons, and you folks have been very vocal and right about uh, there should not be a uh, whole categories of customers being de-risked from institutions, whether they be money service businesses, charities, whatever categories you want, you want to do that in the past have presented challenges. Um, so all of that is, um, I believe can be can be handled, but the regulators need to buy into that. And so um, I, I was thinking as I was listening to you and listening to Andy, uh, folks on the call, there's a report out, uh, it's been out for over a year now from the Security and Chari uh, Charity and Security Network, which the private sector uh, financial institutions we were involved in. And that report talked about a couple of things that I think is relevant here. That is, if the financial sector knew more about the customers that they are banking, in that case, humanitarian groups and charities, in your case, you know, credit unions of all shapes and sizes, if you knew more about how they're run, how they do their due diligence, it would be easier to have a risk-based approach with those entities because you know, all, one size doesn't fit all, right? And so the example we use in the charity world is that the Red Cross is not the same as a relief organization in a conflict zone. A relief organization in a conflict zone needs that funding, needs that access and can get it, uh, but the institutions that are, are, are being asked to provide that need to make sure the regulators understand how they got there. So show them their processes, show them their due diligence and all that. So communication seems to be the third element. So it's access, security, and as you said, communication. So all of those things, I think, can manage where we are today. Now, I'll just I'll end on this last point. You you mentioned some of some examples of pandemic fraud that's occurred globally, and unfortunately, as we all know, whenever there's a whenever there's a horrific act, whether it's hurricanes, earthquakes, and sadly global pandemics, criminals rise to the top. And you showed examples of how that occurred. In the U.S., I pulled up a few quick examples. I'll just, <clears throat> I'll just mention one because it's relevant and related to what you talked about. We've seen in the U.S., and this comes from one of our law enforcement agencies, that terrorist organizations in, uh, in this particular case, in the Middle East, were targeting American first responders in an online scam. So these groups were trying to raise money by offering bogus uh, personal protective equipment, which, of course, they didn't have. And you, you mentioned that as well. So, excuse me. So I think what, what, when these sorts of things happen, the reaction shouldn't be, we're not going to work with 
organizations created to help first responders, but we're going to have to do a better job of research, due diligence, so that we can bank, and then when we can't, make those decisions based on the facts, not just on a what I would consider sort of a broad-based fear that's not based in reality. So, um, you know, I think this teaches us a lot and hopefully we'll learn from this when this is all over, we all hope it's sooner versus later, that when people change their financial habits, and you mentioned this, you can open up accounts online. You can do that with digital verification. Uh, you can get the low and standard risk accounts and handle those. Uh, I think if we have more cooperation and communication with our regulatory supervisors, then a lot of the things that uh, Andy's fearful of and Shana, you mentioned, I think can be overcome. So uh, again, been through this a long, long time. Years ago, it was only about drug trafficking when we talked about money laundering. But now, as you point out, it's not just terrorism, it's elder abuse, it's charity. For, it's all sorts of things that financial institution executives who are not law enforcement are asked to understand, detect, and report. That's a big ask. That's hard. And so if we're going to do that, we need the support of the supervisors and we need the risk-based approach to work. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll stop there and get off my smaller soapbox. Well, great, John, that's all, all three of you, just great information uh, for our attendees out there. And I want to note a couple of things. Again, if you have questions for Shauna, if you have questions for Andrew, Andy, if you have questions for John, please use the Q&A panel on the bottom of your screen. You can write your question there and I will ask them. Also, we've got a couple of questions about whether or not the record, this is gonna be recorded and shown elsewhere it is. We are recording it. It will be available on our YouTube channel uh, probably later today or tomorrow. That's youtube.com slash woku, youtube.com slash woku. So if you wanna see, uh, refer back to this, you can see it there. Uh, we do have one question that has come in and this is for Shauna. Zeline asks, with the increase of online activity, what changes are being done with FinTrack and Interact for the ability to recall or recourse on e-transfers? And then secondly, what keywords would you suggest are new to add to our flagged system to identify more fraud? All right. Um, I don't know if I completely understand the first question. Um, so maybe you can give me a little bit more context uh, specifically. Um, but I know that in some countries, FIUs have given quite specific um, guidance about specific um, fraud um, types of categories of fraud, types of entities that have been used. Um, and that might be the kind of information that FIUs pass on to regulated entities, I hope. Um, I know that you know, in different countries, that level of guidance is kind of very different. Um, in countries where there is some sort of public-private um, partnership, it's usually better in terms of getting that information out um, much earlier. Um, but I can't tell you specifically, and maybe uh, John or others um, have, have more specific advice on how to um, kind of identify this in your, on your transaction monitoring. Um, but the idea for us, and this is what's quite difficult, is to look at the activities, um, to look at what is normal business activity, and to identify what's different. And the, the difficulty at the moment, and that's, this is what a lot of entities have told us, is that nothing is really normal. Um, everybody is, has kind of changed the way they operate. Um, and that's, I think, the, the really the key, the key issue um, for the big institutions, for smaller institutions, um, is to try to identify what is kind of normal in the current situation um, and to kind of pick out things that are, um, you know, that don't sit right. And the, the kind of examples I gave you of people who um, were not at all involved in providing um, health services or providing protective um, equipment, and then overnight became uh, huge providers of these materials, um, suggests that there is something that does not sit quite right there. And those are the kinds of situations that we would be expecting, you know, and entities to be picking up and reporting. I don't know if I answered the question, Greg. So she, Zeline just put in a, a, a follow-up to explain a little better, saying with the increase of online activity, what changes are being done with FinTrack and Interact for the ability to recall or recourse on e-transfers? And then will anything change in getting e-transfers held to investigate? Um, so I think, I mean, that's a specific question in a particular jurisdiction. I'm not really um, ready okay. to respond to that. 
Okay. Uh, we have a question, and I don't know if anybody, if, if Shauna, you have uh, seen this in FATF, but the question is from Greg, do you have a geographical heat map showing in which countries these risks are most predominant? Uh, so I can give you a very quick answer to that. It's no, um, and it would be very political for us to do something like that. But I know that um, there are lots of service providers that, that do provide um, those sorts of things. I've also seen risk assessments of particular countries, which kind of identify that, um, not specifically in related to COVID-19, but maybe there are service providers that are doing that. I would just add that uh, that's, uh, I agree with you that that's where you'd find it from service providers. I always worry about geographic risk from this standpoint. Um, you know, you can have, if you're going to look at what's your rationale, right, for making something a risky jurisdiction, you'd say our country in the United States is risky given what's going on. So I think it's got to be in combination. You can certainly look at conflict zones. And we've seen, I've seen red flags about foreign financial, uh, foreign fighters that end up in conflict zones and then start doing financial transactions. And so that could be a red flag. But I, I, I do think that uh, simply, and the, the, the questioner didn't say it this way, so I'm not saying, suggesting that, but I wouldn't put geographic risk in its own bucket. I think you factor that in, but I think that's probably why we get de-risking, right? So people look at certain areas. Now, does that mean you shouldn't be on alert in certain spaces over others? No, but I think you have to use it in context with other risk factors, which, which again, I'm, I'm assuming that the questioner understands that as well. But to me, I would worry about just giving out a, a heat map of uh, geographic areas, but I know a lot of vendors sell that process. One thing uh, that just came in from Karen uh, to all the panelists, she, uh, not a question, but just a point to make, saying the need for the broader understanding of financial crime in frontline staff requires greater online education at all levels. And she just thinks that would be a good point to make at this forum. Is that something that any of you have seen uh, an increase in through the pandemic? Does there need to be more of it provided to frontline staff? Well. Um, I would just say that this has historically been an issue, Greg, uh, because the regulators in the U.S. correctly have said you need, a, you need targeted training. So frontline needs to know certain things. Compliance needs to know certain things, lines of business. I think this area, as uh, the last question that Shauna was addressing, with the changes during the pandemic, with all the more moving to online, I think it is time to train those frontline people in addition to what they already have. A targeted training has been a gap in the US for a while and it's something we're trying to work on. What about from a global perspective, Shauna, is that something FATF is aware of? I know it's, it's probably not directly under your purview, but is that something that you've seen a greater need for and, and perhaps a, a greater push for? Yeah, I mean, in, in general, um, what we're asking for is greater outreach from the supervisors or regulators, as you say. Um, and so hopefully, I mean, this is kind of um, key to making them understand, uh, for entities to understand the risks at the moment. Um, and it doesn't, it can be supervisors, it can be from law enforcement, it depends on how a country is set up that way. Um, ourselves, I know, um, we used to do a lot of training face to face, not just for um, assessors and different things, but also countries. And we've moved a lot of that online during COVID-19. Um, so what I would like to see, I think, is um, for us to use again this opportunity uh, to make some of these training facilities available to a much wider, large, you know, a group of people. Um, you know, why not? Let's let's take the time now to, to do these things and to reach um, a, a broader range of people. And hopefully that will make it um, more possible for us to kind of communicate, you know, in a faster way what the issues are. Yeah, in fact, we just got a couple of questions coming in saying, one says a lot of the um, issue that they face is um, trying to establish what the new online activity looks like. And that kind of falls in with, uh, I guess, what you were talking about with the PPEs and charities. Um, so, and, you know, this question I think was asked earlier, and I don't know if it was answered or not, but, you know, are there keywords that perhaps could be added into systems to flag um, you know, more of these cases of fraud from some of these new activities? So, I mean, I don't, I can't, again, I mean, yes, I would say so. Um, I don't know what those words would be, unfortunately, but I have 
been at many kind of um, outreach activities and I think the best kind of um, presentation I had was from sort of a cyber nerd uh, who was telling us about all types of um, different um, cyber security issues. Um, and they have done, there are lots of organizations that have done a lot of research uh, on this, the types of entities that are involved. And there certainly are, I think, um, particular types um, of activity that occur more. Um, so again, this is really, um, I think the job of um, the financial intelligence units, law enforcement, um, to really look at these things and, and pass that information on to the private sector. Interesting question here from Taylor. Want to know, are there any categories of financial crimes that have decreased during the pandemic? Yeah, that's a question that um, we've asked ourselves too. And um, during early stages, it wasn't particularly in relation to predicate crimes, but there, there have been lots of um, kind of crossed messages on cash, at least. Um, in some jurisdictions, they're saying, you know, there's a redu reduction um, in cash going through uh, cash intensive businesses. Um, and so com criminal organizations haven't been able to launder that money that way. Um, they're storing cash. They're trying to um, find other ways to invest. So um, in gold, in, in other kind of um, facilities. So th there's been uh, issues like that. But again, in, in some countries, um, there's also been um, information about criminals using kind of cash out strategies, using individuals to um, take money out through ATMs, et cetera, and that, you know, money laundering through cash is still very much alive. It really, I think, depends on the jurisdiction and kind of the culture around cash and also the situation in terms of COVID-19. The other thing we've seen in, in particular sectors, I don't know, I think in relation to credit unions, but um, for example, casinos um, haven't been open, in-person casinos, but maybe a lot, some of that activity has gone online to online casinos. Um, potentially um, money laundering through real estate has potentially slowed down. There were some countries who, who had mentioned that. Um, but again, it, you know, it really depends, I think, on the country and the current situation that they're in. One of the points you made, and we'll, we're waiting for a few more questions from our attendees, but one of the points you made that I thought was interesting, you said that you had highlighted a heavy handed approach by regulatory supervisors will backfire internationally because it tends to move these people underground, basically, which is the worst case scenario. Explain that. Why, why is that the worst case scenario? Because um, the unregulated center uh, is not sending suspicious transaction reports. Um, you know, we have no visibility and it comes up a lot in the mutual valuation reports um, that we do. There are in many countries, um, a huge part of the economy that is just informal, which is maybe the context of the country. And that's why we kind of encourage financial inclusion, not just because it's good for society and it's, you know, um, helping to empower people, but also because it actually reduces money laundering risks. And that's the way we see it. Um, and so, there is this, this issue that, for one thing, law enforcement has less visibility um, of these activities. If, if nobody is collecting information, they're not filing reports on it. But there's also the other issue, which is that criminal organizations could be actually trying to take advantage, um, trying to buy particular um, businesses that are struggling, investing in businesses now, including potentially um, forms of financial institutions, other businesses, to, to prepare themselves for their laundering activities um, in the future. Um, and so that's why I think, again, it's really, really important um, that we ask everybody to be thoughtful uh, about the risks at the moment, um, both government and the private sector. Uh, this is a question from Sally for John. She said her question goes to John because from his comments, uh, she notes that he's been involved in the AML regulatory framework with banks as well as credit unions. She says in Africa, I note that this framework doesn't exist in the credit union world and with the pandemic, Credit unions are now greatly exposed to the increase of online activities. Are there any work streams to embed this framework with our local regulators? Well, that might be something more for, for Andy. I don't know the infrastructure there in Africa, Andy. So uh, it's a good, good question, though. I mean, uh, so uh, from a local perspective, we work with um, countries all over the world to help them you know, strengthen their regulatory frameworks. Uh, yeah, and 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 uh, uh, um, uh, I mean, so I mean, the the answer to that is 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 yes. I mean, different countries have you know different levels of development, different levels of sophistication. Um, so um, uh, I mean, everywhere all over the world is a little bit different. But yeah, we are always working with countries to help them 
um, uh, uh, strengthen and improve their regulatory frameworks. Hey, hey Greg, just real quick, um, another thing that we've seen a rise in, and it's another project that we're involved in, is the use of antiquities and cultural artifacts and art to uh, there's been an increase in that to move illicit funds. And we're involved with an organization called the Antiquities Coalition to push at least in the US because it already is a requirement in the EU that some of those entities have obligations to at least determine beneficial owners of the art before it's sold or purchased uh, in the United States. So we're close, believe it or not, in the chaos that's the US. We are close to legislation that may require those that sell cultural artifacts to actually have policies in place. But we've seen an increase in that. And, and I'll send you uh, after this a report that you can share with the attendees uh, because it was an area that I was not familiar with until a few years ago. And I know FATF has looked at this as well, but it's definitely an area uh, on the increase, unfortunately, and just another space that we need to be aware of. Uh, you've seen that as well at, F at FATF? Yeah, it came up especially um, during sort of the ISIL financing years uh, when we were looking at how they were obtaining their funds. Um, and as John mentioned, especially in Europe, they've identified this as an issue. I saw that there was the US Treasury recently put out a release um, about the risks in the sector. So again, this is um, important for us. And I think, again, I mean, I, I want to mention it because the FATF changed its standards in 2012 to apply this risk-based approach. And there are lots of countries that are still kind of in the learning curve. Um, there were countries already applying a risk-based approach before 2012, but definitely not the majority. And what we really ask countries to do is, you know, not just look at the minimum standards in our, uh, in our requirements, but also look at all the different risks and change the requirements according to that. Um, and that's what we've seen, for example, in Europe, that they've gone beyond what we require. Um, currently, we don't require um, obligations on um, art dealers. But in Europe, they have introduced that. Um, and it's interesting that the US is looking to do so as well. Another question here, and I think this is probably, uh, uh, the answer is going to be a lot, but how has Bitcoin or other digital currencies changed the landscape of money laundering and terrorism financing? Yeah, again, another area where we do a lot of work on and, you know, part that I've tried to kind of avoid actually as much as possible because it is a very technical area. But again, that's something that came up um, in this report. Maybe I should have um, mentioned it in my presentation, but cybercrime is very closely linked um, to, to money laundering through virtual assets. Um, we've, we've extended the, the regulations, the FATF standards to virtual assets um, and countries are kind of in different stages of incorporating this. Um, but the sorts of things you see, uh, you know, people sending mal malware attacks um, and then um, requesting ransoms in virtual assets. Or we've also seen um, people, criminal organizations, trying to identify and target individuals to change um, uh, normal assets through bank accounts, through cash into virtual assets as well. Um, those are some of the examples that we got through the COVID-19 report, but there are, there are many. Um, and I definitely say it's an area uh, that we're, we're monitoring very closely. We reduced, we um, produced risk indicators um, at our last meeting. So I can include the link uh, to that in our chat as well. Uh, but that might be something useful um, for, for the credit unions if that's relevant. John, from a US standpoint, has there, have you seen a lot of that? Yeah, in fact, the, uh, uh, the criminal division of the IRS just released a report two days ago, and they focused on Bitcoin uh, scams that are, are causing tremendous amount of uh, challenges at the, you know, at the very least. And FinCEN, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, so the US uh, FIU has issued some really excellent advisories and information on this space. But I think uh, Shauna's point is well taken. It's really, at least for some of us who've been around a long time, it's really complicated and to really understand how cryptocurrency works, sort of the next generation of both bankers, law enforcement, credit union executives need, need to get up to speed on this because it's, it's moving rapidly and it's taking advantage of many that, that don't understand how this works. So I, I, would, I, would, I would definitely agree that virtual or cryptocurrency, however you characterize it, is a major, major challenge, not just during the pandemic, but just in general. One final question here, since we've got about five minutes left, we'll make this the final one. But Melanie asks, how will our requirements be impacted with open banking regarding money laundering?
No one, you stumped the, you stumped the panel, <laughs> Melanie. Do you, are you guys looking for more clarification on that question or? Yes, please. Yeah, not, <laughs> not sure what open banking means. If it means less uh, requirements up front, sort of what, uh, what Shauna alluded to before, you know, the ability to open up line, uh, accounts online with not limited information, but less information because they're lower risk, that sort of thing. Yeah, a lot. I mean, it, it, it's kind of different around the world, but a lot a lot of places, I mean, particularly Australia, they're moving to uh, where your data, you know, belongs to the customer and it, it they're making it easy now to take, if, if you want to move from one bank to a credit union, uh, you know, the, the financial institutions have obligations to, you know, make that easy and transfer your data, data over. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, so there are a lot of issues around the security between financial institutions. Um, but but I, I think from the financial institution perspective, I mean, your anti-money laundering um, requirements are going to remain virtually the same in your obligations under under your framework. But there are, there are definite issues between the, you know, the, the ability to transfer uh, data between institutions in the EU, the GDPR has made it a lot easier, although it's not as extensive as what they've done in Australia. And in a lot of areas are moving to this, uh, you know, to make it easier for customers to move um, uh, among various financial institutions. And so I think there are going to be a lot of complexities that come along with that. But uh, anti-money laundering requirements, I think, uh, are going to remain this, the, the same on the institutions, although they're going to have to look at it, you know, as far as when data is, you know, flying back and forth between institutions. Just, um, just on that point, Andy, so um, the FATF is actually doing quite an exciting new project about this. Mm. We have a new um, German presidency of the FATF and there, there are a number of projects under it, but we're looking at the issue of digital transformation um, and how it can change uh -huh. the nature of um, how people comply with anti-money laundering requirements. And there is a specific project on data pooling um, and data protection um, and how financial institutions can potentially share that information in a safe way um, that protects people's privacy, but also enhances the way they're doing anti-money laundering. Because currently at the, at the moment, you know, a lot of institutions are only seeing one part of the transaction um, and the other part is missing. And so we're kind of guesstimating what the risks are, uh, which is how the current system has been developed. But we're thinking about in the future, how things could be. And we're trying to involve a range of stakeholders in that discussion. Um, but yes, mm. um, it is, it's a very interesting question and, and the role of fintechs um, in, in anti-money laundering is, is really an interesting and exciting space, I think. Well, that uh, brings us to the top of the hour here. And I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, Melanie says that is encouraging. Please keep us posted. I think that's for Shauna. So I'm sure Andy will do a good job of that too in some of his writings. So I wanna thank uh, everybody who's joined us today um, from, I think we had 25 countries the last I saw that were registered people from 25 countries registered for this. Shauna Christian, thank you so much for joining us. Great information from the Financial Action Task Force. And John Byrne from AML Right Source, great information from you as well. Andy, uh, always uh, a pleasure to see you. I'm sure I'll see you later today. So, um, so thanks everyone. And again, the recording of this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel probably later this afternoon or tomorrow. And that again is YouTube youtube.com slash w-o-c-c-u youtube.com slash woku thanks everyone <laughs>